This is the Natural History Museum. Welcome to NHM Live. In a couple of minutes, you'll be meeting one of our scientists. This is your chance to ask some questions directly. We look forward to hearing from you. Let's find out who our scientist is today. I'm Gavin Broad, Principal Curator of Hymenoptera. That's the insect order that covers ants, bees, wasps and sawflies. The group that I look after are the parasitoid wasps, so these are the nasty things that lay their eggs in or on other insects and eat them alive. When people think of wasps, they tend to think of the black and yellow stingy things. There's actually about 100,000 species that we know of out there, probably many times that undescribed. One of the things I really love about this job is the discovery, so I can go into the cabinets in our collection, pull open a drawer and find wasps that nobody's ever seen before since they were collected in the you know, 1930s, 1950s. They've just lain there unknown. And I can try and identify these, put a name to them, describe new species. They come in all shapes and sizes and they tend to get overlooked. So one of my missions in life is to make these things more accessible to the world. Hello and welcome to NHM Live. I'm Alison and I'm joined today by Gavin, who's our curator of Hymen Opera, Optera. And we're talking today about wasps. We've got some fantastic specimens to show you. And this is, of course, your chance to ask Gavin your questions. So please do post those and we'll try to answer them as we go along. Now, Gavin, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, now, we are, we're doing a bit of positive PR for wasps today, aren't we? Because they, they have a bit of a bad rep. Yeah, amazingly. Some people think that wasps are like these sort of angry cousins of bees. But, I mean, they're amazing creatures in their own right. And uh, I want to sort of show how these things are incredibly useful, as well as being uh, beautiful and uh, disgusting and gruesome at the same time. <laughs> There are lots of reasons to admire wasps, aren't there? And in fact, we do have in our collection uh, one example that tells us that not everybody uh, hates wasps so much. Some people have quite warm feelings for them, don't they? Absolutely. You can't get a better fan than Sir John Lubbock. So Sir John Lubbock was a 19th century polymath uh, parliamentarian, introduced the Bank Holiday Act, introduced the Protection of Ancient Monuments Act to protect Stonehenge, was a neighbour of Darwin's, uh, all-round good guy, and he wrote extensively on ants, bees and wasps and tamed a wasp that he collected on holiday in the Pyrenees, uh, brought it back on a train to Britain, uh, basically fed her and looked after her and exhibited her at an association of scientists. And then there's a little moving tribute to her death in nature. So that wasp was well loved and I still get the occasional pilgrim Lubbock followers who really want to come and see this wasp in the museum. Fantastic, a pet wasp. I, I imagine they, they must be quite low maintenance pets. They are. I, I'd recommend them if you have a very small flat, uh, you know, solitary wasps <laughs> yep. in studio apartments. Yeah. But uh, as long as you give them sugar to keep them going, uh, the young require protein, but, you know, the adult wasps, they just need carbohydrates. So, yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty easy, pretty easy. Mm -hmm. uh, now, ah, we've got a question online from Lucy already. What is your favourite wasp? So my favourite wasp would have to be one that I've got some personal attachment to. So it's the new species that I've, well, at the moment, it's the new species I've found in my garden. Oh. Uh, just because uh, I could, well, just wander out my dressing gown to check the moth trap in the morning and there's an undescribed wasp. I used to catch it quite commonly. And we've got a, a question from Stacey who's wondering, is there anything in particular that attracts wasps to sting certain people? Um, no, to be honest. I mean, there's, you, you hear about people being more uh, attractive to wasps, but I've never seen any particular evidence they are. Um, I suspect it's much more to do with whether you're standing in the sunshine, uh, flapping your arms around a lot, drinking lemonade, things like that. Now we've got um, uh, just a snapshot, some, some of our collection of wasps here. Now the ones at the top here, these are the ones that we'll be most familiar with, aren't they? The, the yep. common wasps, this is the one we all, we all know and love. But it, it, there's so much more to this group of insects, isn't there? They're, they're, yeah. they're a vast group. What, what have we got here? They are. So, I mean, the waspy world has an awful lot of different, um, well, as I said, you know, hundreds of thousands of species probably, but only a few of them are actually recognisable as the black and yellow stingy wasps. Um, the common wasp, Vespula vulgaris, is, you know, a really conspicuous part of our fauna because they have big nests, there's loads of them out there. They've got bigger relatives that you'd also recognise as being wasps, like the hornets. This is a giant hornet. Wow. Uh, sort of uber wasp. And then you've got relatives of these that don't make nests, 
but still uh, not paper nests or mud nests. They just make a little hole in the ground. And, and those are things like the cockroach hunters, like these jewel wasps. They're absolutely beautiful. I was surprised at how colourful some wasps are as well. Some things that I wouldn't necessarily even recognise as a wasp. No, well, they come in so many shapes and sizes. It's hard to sort of say what a wasp is. I mean, they all have a wasp waist, you know, that narrow constriction between the abdomen and the thorax. Uh, they've got quite long antennae compared to flies. And the whole insect order, Hymenoptera, have these little hooks that keep the hind wings and the fore wings attached when they're flying, which is unique to that group. But um, the other wasps, I suppose, are often mistaken for flies, you know, little things on your, uh, that basically uh, do not look very distinguishing. Often you don't even notice them because they're so small. And it's those that make up the bulk of the diversity out there. Now, we've got a lot of questions about stings, unsurprisingly. Right. Uh, how many times have you been stung by a wasp? That must be an occupational hazard. Oh, yeah, yeah, 46. <laughs> um, I get stung quite a lot. You know, when you're doing field work in the tropics especially, you get, and you're out in the forest with a, a light and a white sheet, you get loads of wasps and you get stung all the time. Uh, I'm not allergic to them so far, so no fortunately, problems. Fortunately, fortunately. Yeah. What has the, the nastiest sting, the most painful? Is there a particular wasp? So or? the most painful wasp is apparently the tarantula hawk, particularly Pepsis heros, oh, which is yes. massive. Yeah, we do have an example here, don't we? Yes, yeah, so we show that. So this is the largest uh, well, basically the bulkiest wasp we know of. This is Pepsis heros that flies around in the in South America, and this is after tarantulas, which is why it's so big, and it has an amazing venom, which is used for both sort of defensively when predators want to eat it, and also to paralyze the tarantula. Yeah, if you're going up against a tarantula, you need a, you need a fairly impressive venom and, a, and a, a good size as well. Absolutely, they don't stand a chance. So, uh, so those are the biggest uh, solitary wasps, is that right? right? There's a difference yeah. between solitary and social wasps. Yeah, so the social wasps are basically a bunch of the, they're a specialised branch of these wasps that provision a nest. So you've got things like the tarantula hawk, it basically makes a hole in the ground and raises one young on a tarantula, or even uses the tarantula's own home, which is a bit cheeky. Uh, and then you've got the social wasps that have evolved from those sorts of wasps, but they've taken to cooperating. Um, and in fact, you know, most of them sacrifice the right to make their own nest. They just create a huge nest and bring the food in there and they can progressively rear more and more young in one area. So do all wasps sting or is it specific to certain wasps? Yeah, I mean, they're probably, they all, very few wasps have lost the ability to sting. Uh, one conspicuous group is a group of ants, which are basically specialised wingless wasps. Uh, like, they just spray formic acid instead. But most wasps sting and as well as using it defensively, an awful lot of wasps are using it to lay eggs as well in their hosts. Not the social wasps that build nests, but most of the other parasitoid wasps have a dual function, sting and ovipositor. Ah, oh, now we've got an ovipositor here, haven't we? Oh, and I should point, yeah, I mean, this thing's massive. Um, obviously, these can't sting you. Uh, they wouldn't be able to really get a good grip on your skin or anything like that. But they are using this massive long ovipositor to drill through wood to find a host that's deep inside, and then they use the ovipositor to sting the host, they squeeze an egg all the way down that, lay it on the host that's paralysed inside the wood. Now Nadia online is asking, why are wasps so much more aggressive from bi than bees? Are they? I don't think that's true. I think people sort of think that, but um, by all accounts, you know, some of the bees are amazingly aggressive, like one of those Apis dorsata, which is an Asian honeybee species that we don't have in Europe. Uh, that's supposed to be incredibly aggressive. Uh, you can get mobbed by thousands of those. Uh, wasps can be quite aggressive. I suppose we just sort of Keep, uh, we keep forgetting that bees can sting you and their venom's actually quite toxic because they make honey. And uh, again on stings, uh, Lucy's asking, do both female and male wasps sting? Which is no, a good question. It is good. Uh, a lot of misconceptions about that. Uh, males cannot sting. Because the sting is basically a modified egg-laying organ, males have never been able to sting. So a very few species have modified like, prick, uh, prick points at the end of their abdomen so they can prick you. But that's very rare. They can't inject any venom. Okay. Um, we've got a question from uh, Nicola, uh, back to our bigger wasp. Uh, what's the biggest wasp we have in the museum? Would it be this one? Yeah, I mean, this is the most massive, Pepsis. Uh, I mean, some of the longest ones are the things like this Megarissa. They are, I mean, they're still not quite up there with the biggest stick insects or anything, but we, they're the biggest wasps anyway. Uh, they, and you get a few that should proportionally have the ovipositor. I think the record is up to like about 14 times the body length. Wow. So, that is impressive. incredibly impressive things. Um, we've got a great question uh, from Aaron, who's eight years old. What's the purpose of a wasp? Uh, <laughs> just to give us fun picnics. And, <laughs> no, I mean, wasps are out there doing a huge number of useful jobs that we're often not aware of. Um, these are 
top predators. So they're clearing your garden, the landscape generally, of huge numbers of caterpillars, aphids, other insects. So they're keeping numbers of potential pests low. I mean, we use tiny little parasitoid wasps to control pests in, in uh, greenhouses, out in the wild, controlling you know, crops like cassava in Africa, basically being saved by little wasps. Uh, incredibly valuable to us. Now, you mentioned the parasitoids there. We actually, earlier in the week, went behind the scenes with Gavin to find out a little bit more about this group of insects. So let's find out how we got on. So we've just been learning all about wasps and we'll be back in the studio soon to answer more of your questions. But we're behind the scenes in the collection spaces because I wanted to find out about one particular group of wasps. Gavin, what are we looking at here? So we've got a draw of Hymenoptera, different wasps, but mostly these parasitoid wasps. And these are the sorts of wasps that basically lay their eggs in or on other insects, eat them alive. They're really specialised insects, that sort of parasites that turn into predators, completely eating their host. So they always kill their host? Always. That's one of the definitions of parasitoid. It's a, it's a gruesome life cycle, isn't it? But I noticed that some of them are actually surprisingly beautiful creatures. I've got a camera here. I can try and focus in on some of them. Yeah. What are we looking at here? So these are the jewel wasps up there, and those are cockroach hunters. They basically sort of zombify the cockroach hosts. They sort of take over their brains and uh, get the cockroach to walk into a nest that the wasp has made. And then obviously lay an egg on it and its larvae eat the cockroach alive. It's grimly fascinating, it really is. They seem like quite a diverse group. Um, how, how diverse are they? So I mean, basically there's about, I don't know, 100,000 species at least out there of parasitoid wasps come in all shapes and sizes. You've got big things like the jewel wasps. You've got tiny little things that you can barely see down here, which are a little thing called en Encarsia that eat whitefly. Yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced there's actually a wasp there. I can barely <laughs> see anything. Now, do we find them all over the world? Absolutely everywhere you go. Uh, it's one of the great things about these wasps. You know, you can study them in your back garden. Uh, if you're really lazy like me, you don't have to move anywhere. Uh, you can go down to the tropics and collect thousands of them. There's about 6,000 species in Britain that have this sort of lifestyle. Um, and what do they typically prey on? So, class, I mean, most of them attack the big orders of insects, so Lepidoptera and the moths and butterflies, uh, beetles, flies. And the ones that really attract attention are the, the wasps that attack caterpillars. So we've got a lovely example there of a, of a hairy caterpillar. I think it's a fox moth. But it's got, it's got a sort of ring of wasp cocoons around it. So the wasp has laid a whole bunch of eggs in there. They've eaten the host alive, burst out and then spun their cocoons on the outside of the host, which lives for a little while afterwards. Wow, and is it just caterpillars they tend to prey on, or is it not, other things? Yeah, not just caterpillars. So we've got a huge wasp here called Rissa, which attacks other wasps, wood wasps, deep inside wood. Um, so that's uh, quite a common strategy, actually, for wasps to attack other wasps. And then you've got uh, great things that eat. You've got the white fly parasitoids that we showed earlier, and there's a whole bunch of species that attack spiders, and they're quite interesting because they manipulate the spider biology quite a lot make wow. the spider spin a different sort of web. Um, so do they have quite a big impact on the insect prey populations? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, some of these things um, we use for that very reason. They're really good at finding hosts and attacking them, you know, because they're sniffing them out amongst the vegetation, amongst really complex habitats. So they're like targeted insecticides almost. So we do use that encarsia that we showed earlier. Is, uh, and we can actually buy that to release in your greenhouse because they're really good at getting rid of whitefly. It's very efficient. So I, I read somewhere that they can actually control the behaviour of their hosts. Yeah, so uh, colleagues are starting to sort of work on this. It's been, well, it's been noticed for quite a while that caterpillars can be sort of mind controlled by the wasps. So the wasps make the caterpillar do something it would never normally do, like climb up a steep object like a fence or wall, or they'll make the caterpillar sit over the wasp cocoons to guard them from predators. Uh, I've got some colleagues in Japan who are studying how spiders are manipulated by wasps. So the wasps basically sort of disrupt the spider hormones. So the spider starts to spin a completely different web, which means that the wasp can then pupate safely in the middle of a really strong web. They don't want the spider wasting any energy catching food at that point, because it's going to be uh, wasp food. And we've actually got a new species here that you found quite recently, haven't we? Yeah, just a few weeks ago, this wasp finally got a name. It's been sitting in the collection since about 1959, and I got around to looking at it recently. And it's now called Genomerum phacocurus. And it's named after the warthog. The warthog? Why is that? It's got a really weird head. It's got the most, well, it's got the weirdest head of any wasp I've seen. It's basically got these huge flanges that come out like warthog tusks. So um, it's only known from this one specimen. It's really distinctive, collected in Tanzania. Do we know why it's got that unusual? No idea. 
We think, based on some related species, that it's going into rotting wood to attack this moth, uh, but it's a bit guesswork at the moment. It's to probably, I imagine, shoveling its way through all this sort of compacted uh, frass, which is caterpillar poo, but we'll have, have to it. find out. <laughs> Let's go to Tanzania and find out. Thank you for all of your questions. Keep them coming in. We've got some great questions so far. Now, Gavin, uh, we saw some parasitoids there. We saw a new species as well. Could there be no more new species lurking our collections? Yeah, absolutely. Tons of them. I mean, most of my field work is probably done in the collection, really, going through drawers of stuff that people have not, have, you know, not had the time or the expertise to look at. So, uh, yeah, there's a treasure trove of new species. Excellent. Keeps you very busy. Um, Alistair is asking, how many species have you yourself discovered? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I've described <laughs> as, as new species about 120 or so, I guess, with collaborators. And that's by not spending a huge amount of time doing that, to be honest. Uh, so it's easy. I mean, my colleague John describes uh, maybe 400 species at a time when he does a big book on Costa Rican wasps. Wow. Uh, so so there's, there's still so much out there to, left to discover. Absolutely. So, I mean, many lifetimes worth. <laughs> Now, Lucy is asking, how do you uh, identify if you actually have a new species? Oh, that's a good question, because uh, obviously uh, these are kind of not very well-known organisms, so you don't, I don't have a big book of wasps. Uh, what I do have is a huge collection, so you can compare to described species. We do have lots of descriptions and illustrations of varying degrees of quality, so a lot of it's detective work, really. You have to make sure it's not already been described by knowing what's or what work's been done in that group before. Uh, and the collection is just my library, really, my collection of wasps. Fantastic. Now, we saw um, in that pre-record there uh, how small some of these parasitoid wasps particularly yeah. are. Lucy online is asking, what's the smallest wasp in the UK? Yeah, well, so I'm not entirely sure. The small. I, th I think it's one of these little things called megaphragma, which are tiny little things, uh, trichogratids, which are basically parasitizing eggs of other insects. Uh, they're about a quarter of a millimetre long, maybe a bit less. Uh, there's some smaller ones known out there in the in the wilds of Costa Rica. What's the smallest in the world? So the smallest in the world is a thing called Kikini Huna. That's uh, a great name. It's a lovely name for wasps. <laughs> and I think if you've got scale bar there, 0.1 millimetre, they're about 0.15 millimetres, something like that. And these things are actively flying and are actually smaller than some single-celled organisms. They must be incredibly difficult to study. How do we How do we find out about them? Incredibly difficult. Huge amounts of collecting work and then preparing slides, carefully mounting tiny things little bits of card so we can study them uh, and in fact you can, and also we would encourage people to help in this process of discovering more about these wasps um, we've got a project online called miniature lives magnified where you can look basically you can help transcribe data from slides so most of what we know about a lot of these tiny wasps is actually contained on these slide labels in our collection so a huge uh, resource but something that, one that needs translating basically yeah there's only a tiny number of people who work on wasps relative to the size of the fauna so you know we need a bit of help absolutely absolutely now guys we've been learning about the the beauty and diversity of wasps and about those gruesome parasitoids as well but there's one more aspect of our collection we're really keen to show you and that's our wasps' nests. Gavin, why do we have this material in our collection? So, uh, this is one of my favourite parts of the collection, actually. <laughs> um, the wasp nests are here as, you know, specimens. They, these are produced by wasps. It's part of their life cycle. It's sort of like keeping, you know, the pupil case of a butterfly, something like that. This is where the wasps are reared. They've created this structure themselves. And from a research point of view, they're fantastically useful for looking at the evolution of really complex behaviours in fairly simple organisms. So they are, have been used by ethologists. So do all wasps build nests? Um, no, just really certain groups. So some of these aculeate wasps that basically are the ones that sting with their sting but don't lay an egg down it anymore. So a lot, these wasps make little nests that are often just holes in the ground uh, or holes in rotten wood. But certain group have taken that quite far and have started and built these paper nests or mud nests. So they become sculptors, you know, uh, artisan paper makers. And we have some examples here. If we start with this little one here, can yeah. you tell us about this? Let's see if the camera picks this up. Uh, this is a tiny little pot of, well, these are beautiful little sort of igloo-like pots made by a potter wasp, appropriately. Um, they often make little clay pots from mud and water with a bit of saliva. Um, this particular species makes uh, a sort of cement uh, outline and then basically cements on pebbles. Uh, to line it, which is quite beautiful, a thing called catiumenes. And in each of these little uh, stone igloo nests, it raises one young. 
furnished with caterpillars for it to eat. And then as soon as it's finished stocking one nest, it moves on, makes a new nest, and then it stocks that with caterpillars and then moves on. The, the, pot, the pottery nests are absolutely beautiful, aren't they? They're, they're like little works of art, a lot of them. They're absolutely oh, yeah. amazed to think that's, that's made by a wasp. I know, yeah. I mean, uh, potters would die to make them, for sure. <laughs> and, I mean, they're just created, really, as a, as a lovely chamber, a very hard chamber, so a lot of things can't get in there, like ants can't penetrate that nest, so it's a really safe environment. Now, Andrew online is asking uh, what the nests are made from. So the pottery ones would be, be mud? Yep, just soft mud. Now, what about some of the bigger nests, like this one here? So this beautiful nest is basically made from papier-mâché. Um, it's, it's chewing, this particular species, like many paper wasps, is chewing up dead wood uh, to create this papier-mâché. And different species often specialise in different sorts of wood. And they will then create different colours, different textures, consistencies, depending on the source of wood. You know, whether it's really pulpy, whether it's quite hard. It's fantastic. What are all these lumps and bumps on the on the outside for? Well, I mean, this is a this is a really different sort of wasp. This uh, nest it's a thing called Polybia scutellaris, and these things have got quite um, a resource they want to protect in here. So it's very hard. I can tap that, and my finger won't go through it. If you did that with a common wasp nest, you'd probably make a hole in it. Um, this is hard card that they've made because they're protecting their young, and they're also protecting honey that they store inside. Now this one's cut in half. Can we can we actually look inside? Yep. So I'll gingerly take this off. Uh, the wasps didn't uh, dissect this. This was done back at the museum. Um, <laughs> there you go. That would be impressive, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. and so we can see all these little compartments inside. They're absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's just rows upon rows of, you know, it's sort of like a tower block, really, mm. with floors of apartments. And each of these little cells, they would rear one young wasp. So they rear they, the female, well, the queen. There's only one queen, I think, in this group. It varies. Some social wasps have multiple queens, some have just one. Anyway, she'll go around, lay an egg in the cell. The workers provision it with chewed up insects and a bit of dead meat, and they rear the wasp in that cell. They spin a bit of silk, pupate, come out. Um, but this is a unique wasp in that it devotes some of its nest to storing honey. Uh, Fantastic. Wasps can wasp. make honey. Yeah, so that's another reason to love wasps. Of course, yes, of one. course. Um, Owen online is asking, are all wasps carnivorous? Not all, most of them. I mean, the basic lifestyle for wasp is they're eating uh, fresh meat. So that's what they've evolved from. They've evolved cunning ways to eat fresh meat. Um, there's a few groups like the pollen wasps, which they aptly named, in, uh, mainly in arid areas in southern Africa and uh, in South America as well, in Australia. Anyway, they uh, give their young pollen. And that's sort of like bees. You know, bees are a specialised group of wasps that became vegetarian. And um, we've got a, a question from Andy about this nest. How long does it take to build such a nest? Um, I guess it would take several months. So a comparable nest in Britain would be made over the course of just the summer. So you're talking four or five months at the most. So it's not very long, really. Uh, this is, you know, its peak has probably got tens of, well, 10,000 workers or more all busily constructing. And each time they make a layer of comb, they're ripping off some of the envelope, the protective covering, and then re put a new layer of comb in, and then they recover that with new envelope. Do so. they reuse the nest? Will they return to the muir after year? No. So wasps abandon their nests after a while, um, basically because partly they may die out, but also it's unhygienic. You know, um, the nests get infiltrated by all sorts of pests and parasites. Although they might like that site. You know, you may discover in your loft that you have wasps coming every year to build a nest because uh, it's such a great loft. <laughs> now we do have one more specimen we're quite keen to show you just to show how resourceful uh, wasps are. Can you tell us about this one? Yeah sure. This is a lovely example of um, wasps sort of tasting uh, in fashion really. This is a common wasp so the sort of species that builds the classic paper nests but these Wasps made their nest in a, a supply of, in a store of clothes, so they basically chewed up some woolly jumper and a tweed jacket <laughs> to create quite a colourful, cosy nest. Yeah, it's very creative. So that they will use different materials, whatever's to hand. Yeah, they're, they're very adaptable. Uh, they've been known to chew up all sorts of materials, like uh, fluorescent cycling jackets. Uh, it's about time we did some experiments, I think, in creating rainbow-coloured nests. Absolutely, absolutely. Just going back to, to this nest here, Alison um, Hendry online is asking, uh, does wasp honey taste the same as bee honey? 
I don't know. I would love to know. <laughs> I, I really like to get hold of some. I don't know Never if it's available. It. I do know that this particular wasp is very hard to culture because they're very sensitive to disturbance. So when people try and tap the nests for honey, they just desert. So you'd only ever get like a small amount at a time. You can't really keep them in hives like you do honeybees. Oh, that's unfortunate. And yeah. Nadia online lost a very interesting question. She says, a lot of insects give us substances uh, like medicines, uh, honey, silk. Do humans harvest anything from wasps? Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we harvest is the wasps themselves to use in biological control in attacking, you know, pest insects. Um, there's some trials going on at the moment for uh, certain cancer therapies from wasp venoms. They've been wow. shown that particular component in this uh, venom of a South American wasp has been shown to be really good at killing rather selectively cancerous cells. So you never know. That's fascinating. So, so all sorts of useful stuff from wasps. Yeah. Uh, so they're, they're very, very helpful in our garden. <laughs> they are things to admire, generally, for their absolutely, ingenuity. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, guys, we are unfortunately running out of time. But don't worry, Gavin will be online for the next 10 minutes or so to answer any of, any of those questions that we didn't get to. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for your questions. They were all excellent. And do remember to join us next week. Thank you.